Well, good evening. It's good to be here with you tonight. Good to have an opportunity to study God's Word with you. Hopefully everyone's had a good Sunday, had a good meal, maybe a good nap, watched the snow fall. I uh, hate that we couldn't be up here together tonight, but we're just a little concerned about how slick the roads are going to be uh, this evening after dark. So here we are. We're going to talk about the rapture this evening, kind of carry on with the series of studies that we've been involved in for several weeks now. I'm not going to put my charts up. I didn't really get everything set up in time for that to work out, uh, but I think you'll be able to follow along just fine. My charts weren't very detailed for tonight anyway. Um, again, I, I've enjoyed this study. I hope that you've enjoyed it as well. Um, I, I think these are things that are practical for us to talk about. If for no other reason, then we can have the opportunity to talk to our friends and neighbors about these important things. Um, we've been doing this in a question answer format throughout our entire study, and I want to do that. There we go. I'm trying to get my sound worked out, and hopefully it's working out for everyone. Uh, if there is an issue, please text me or let me know on YouTube messages. I have both pulled up. And also, as far as our questions, if you have questions tonight, comments that you'd like to make, uh, please text me. Please let me know. I, again, I've got my phone sitting here. I can see your text messages. If you'd rather do it through the YouTube messaging, I actually have that fixed up where I can see it. And I think I'll be able to tell that you've sent me a message pretty quickly and respond to that. Otherwise, I'm just going to preach and just kind of move on through uh, what we're, what we're going to talk about this evening. So let's go ahead and get started with that. And I want to begin tonight by just kind of pointing out four key characteristics of the rapture doctrine. Uh, what do we mean when we talk about the rapture? What are we talking about when we mention the rapture? And I think there's really four key things that we're going to see when people are talking about the rapture. Um, when we're talking about what I'm going to call a pre-tribulation rapture, and I'll define some of these terms here in just a moment, uh, we're talking about a doctrine that teaches that the Lord is going to return secretly and quietly. And that no one's really going to know about this except those that are raptured. Uh, and that's the idea of being caught up or, or taken up with him. And so there are going to be those, according to this doctrine, who are righteous or faithful. And the Lord is going to take them up. He's going to rapture them. But he's not going to make a big noise about it. It's just going to happen. Um, you know, if you're my age or older, you remember all the bumper stickers, don't you? This vehicle will be empty in case of rapture. And, and really, as far as this doctrine's concerned, that's about the only way that we would know that the rapture is, has occurred. We would have to infer it uh, from some things that happen, from the absences of certain people, and so forth. So a secret and quiet coming of the Lord is the first component. The second is that all the saints are caught up, and that's the living and the dead. So there's a resurrection of the righteous, and those that are alive and are faithful to God are taken up to be with him. Now, in the case of a pre-tribulation rapture, that event would be then followed by seven years of tribulation. And really, the last three and a half years of that seven-year period would be a period of very intense tribulation. And then after the end of that seven years, Christ returns with the saints to set up his kingdom, a thousand-year kingdom, and I think we're going to talk about that a little bit next Sunday night. Again, if you're just now joining us, um, I'd love to hear comments, get questions from you. You can text me at my phone number, and I can also see the YouTube comments at the moment, so just let me know if there's something you'd like to add or some question that you have. So four components to the, the rapture doctrine, the pre-tribulation rapture doctrine. A secret, secret and quiet coming of the Lord. All the saints, both living and dead, are going to be caught up. A seven-year tribulation. And then Christ returning uh, with the saints to set up his thousand-year kingdom. Now, what I want to do, and I, I hope you have your Bibles with you. Again, I, I don't have the charts up tonight. Uh, but I want to look at a few of what I'm going to call end-time passages. And these are going to be rather simple passages, I think, to understand. And what I want to do is I want to look at those with you, and I want to just ask the single question, 
Does this fit what we're hearing with this idea of a pre-tribulation rapture, this idea of a secret and quiet coming, this idea of, of a resurrection only of the righteous and a catching away uh, of the living saints, this idea of seven years of tribulation or a thousand-year kingdom to follow? Do these rather simple passages seem to suggest that? The first passage I want to look at tonight is John chapter 5. John chapter 5, and if you have your Bible, go ahead and open up to that passage. John chapter 5, and then verses 28 through 29. John chapter 5, verses 28 through 29. He says, Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs <laughs> will hear his voice and will come forth. Those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life and those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. Now, a couple of questions I think are important for us to ask as we're looking at this particular passage, um, or a couple of things I think we ought to notice as we're looking at this particular passage. First of all, I want you to notice that phrase, the hour is coming. Look at that, verse 28. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming. It seems to me that Jesus in this passage is talking about a specific point in time and the language would indicate a single point in time. That as far as time is concerned, we're not looking at two separate events or two events separated by seven years or however many years it would be. We're looking at two events that occur simultaneously. A single resurrection of two groups of people might be a better way of putting it, and that's exactly what's described. A resurrection of both the good and the wicked. Now let me ask you in John 5, 28 and 29, again, I think this is a relatively simple passage. Where do we find room for seven years, for tribulation, and for all of those things? And the only answer I can give to that is that we don't. So I've already got a question that's come in, and I think it's a very good question. Mackenzie asks, so is the seven-year tribulation to test, she says, I don't like that word for it, but to see whether we deserve heaven or hell, I think it is a, a testing, yes. I, I think those that remain are going to have an opportunity, at least according to this doctrine, uh, to repent uh, and, and therefore, thereby find themselves in a different position. And, and those that don't, those that fail, are going to be destroyed. So in a sense, yes, it's a test. In a sense, it's a time of trial, um, which is warning you of, of Christ's coming return. Now, once he comes back for that thousand-year kingdom, um, I, I think in the minds of most premillennialists, then you can't do anything about it. Uh, he's going to come to fight against those who are not saints, and in doing that, he is going to destroy them. So, yes, there's, there's I, I would say, a concept of testing uh, involved in that. So, good question. I appreciate that. So John chapter 5, we saw a single point in time, an hour. We saw the resurrection of both the righteous and the dead occurring at that same time. Not two separate events divided by seven years, but the same resurrection or two groups of people resurrected at the same time. Again, maybe that's the best way to put it. Let's go ahead and go to another passage. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This will be a little bit longer reading, but notice what he says here, beginning of verse 22. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. So he's talking about the resurrection to come, and he's comparing the death through Adam to life in Christ. Verse 23, but each in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, after that those who are Christ at his coming. So Christ is resurrected first, right? We all understand that. Christ has already been raised from the dead, hasn't he? He was resurrected sometime in the past, and now we're looking forward to our resurrection, to a different resurrection. So each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits. After that, those who are Christ at his coming, then comes the end. So we've got the resurrection of those who are Christ, belong to Christ. Then comes the end. When he hands over the kingdom to the God and Father, when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign until he's put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is death, verse 26 says. Verse 27, 
For he has put all things in subjection under his feet, but when he says all things are put in subjection, it's evident that he is accepted who put all things in subjection to him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself also will be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him. So it's talking about the relationship of the Father and the Son there at the end. But I, again, I want you to notice some things. You know, I think he's, he's speaking specifically about the resurrection of the righteous, those who are Christ at his coming. So they're raised, and then verse 24 says, then comes what? Not seven years of tribulation, followed by a great war, followed by a thousand-year kingdom, followed by the final resurrection, followed by the ascension in heaven. That's not what it says. It says that there's a, an order to the resurrection. Christ was first. Then those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end. Now, that's kind of hard for me to put a thousand and seven years between the end of verse 23 and the beginning of verse 24. And then I want you to notice as well what happens at this point at this resurrection. Verse 25, or back to verse 24, then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to the God and Father when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power. So, Paul, when he's describing the resurrection, he doesn't describe a situation in which men are going to be raised from the dead and then Jesus is going to establish his kingdom and reign for some period of time. He describes the very opposite. He describes a resurrection, and then after the point of that resurrection, Christ doesn't establish a kingdom. Instead, he hands that kingdom back to the Father. So again, very hard to fit a, a thousand years in there. And I think that's interesting because this is actually one of the chapters that a lot of premillennialists would turn to who believe in a pre-tribulation rapture in order to teach that doctrine of the rapture. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if you look down toward the end of the chapter where he talks about us being changed in the twinkling of an eye, verse 51 and 52 Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. A lot of the premillennialists would tell us that that's actually a picture of the rapture. But when you go earlier in the chapter and you connect all these things together, it just won't work. He says there's going to be a resurrection and it specifically says those who are Christ are going to be raised, then comes the end, followed by Christ turning the kingdom over to the Father. Very different from the idea that we're, that's expressed to us regarding the rapture from those who believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. I've got another couple of questions here. Uh, Clinton asks, do all that have since died earn the right of testing like the generation alive during the tribulation? Do they all get tested as well? And uh, as far as I know, no. I don't think the wicked are going to be raised within that seven-year period and given an opportunity uh, to be tested, if that's the question that you're asking. And why is that? I have no idea. I have no idea. Um, you know, to me, that's kind of like the doctrine of election. It's so random and arbitrary. Um, it, it's hard to imagine the God of heaven would operate in such a way. But that is a really good question. Uh, Colby asked, where do those who have already been raptured go during the thousand-year reign? I think that's a really good question. So if, if I'm alive at the rapture or, or, or I'm raised at the rapture and Jesus takes me up, I'm, there, I'm with Jesus in heaven for seven years, and at the end of the seven years, <clears throat> he's going to come back to earth, fight this, this battle. We'll talk about all that in the next couple of weeks, reign for a thousand years. Well, where do I go? I have to leave heaven and come with him. According to premillennialism, the saints who are raptured, who are in heaven, get to stay for seven years and come back. And that's, that's part of this doctrine that I'll, I'll never understand. I, I don't know why people find it to be attractive. If it's true, it's true. I think we're proving tonight that that's probably not going to be the case. And, and so I do have to wonder what's the... What is, why would I want to return here after I've been there for any period of time, much less something like seven years in order to live on earth? And I know the answer would be it's going to be a renewed earth. 
it, there's going to be peace. There's going to be tranquility. It's still not going to be heaven. It's still not going to be heaven. So I'm, I'm with you there. I don't know why, why someone would want to do that. Let's move on a little bit. Let's talk about some key passages that are used to describe the end of the tribulation, or excuse me, used to support the rapture. And, and really the whole book of Revelation is used to support this doctrine of the rapture. But there's an interesting thing, and this is kind of interesting, really not just looking at the book of Revelation, but looking at this doctrine of the rapture as a whole. If you start reading after the the religious scholars who really push this doctrine, and you start trying to find a single verse that they will turn to that, that speaks of the rapture, what you're going to find is that they don't have one. And as a matter of fact, that's a common admission among those who teach this doctrine. There's no single verse that teaches a pre-tribulation rapture. What you'll be told is that you have to kind of infer that from a lot of passages. And we're going to look at the primary one here in just a moment. But here's some of the other ones that they look at. The whole book of Revelation. Um, and really, they start in chapter 1, is, and John is caught up in the Spirit in chapter 1. They say that prefigures our rapture and that we're going to be raptured in the same way. I don't know where in the, Re- in the book of Revelation, especially in chapter 1, we find any such notion. What we find is John, like many prophets before him, receiving a vision, and it's an inspired vision, and he refers to it as being caught up in the Spirit. This is not the idea of, of being taken from the earth violently, only to be returned. Uh, none of the components of the pre-tribulation rapture are found in Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 17 through 19 are often used to support the rapture. Uh, even though they don't talk about it at all, I, I don't know that they speak of it in any way whatsoever. Uh, but the idea there is we see the end of the tribulation and the inauguration of the kingdom. And so since we see that, um, there's an inference there. But again, and, and we're studying Revelation on Wednesday night. And if you want to read that book and find the place for me where there's some violent taking away of those who are faithful, some snatching away, which is what the word we'll look at in just a moment, translated rapture means, if you can find the place in Revelation where the faithful are snatched away and then returned, then we'll have to talk about it. But I don't think you're going to find any mention of anything in the book of Revelation that comes even close to this idea of a rapture. Now, I would notice a couple of things with you. I want you to turn over to Revelation chapter 20. One of the things that we're told when when we're talking with premillennialists or when you're reading after uh, the doctrine of premillennialism, the doctrine of the rapture, the pre-tribulation rapture, is that those who don't believe in it, so me, probably you at this point, those who don't believe in it don't read the Bible literally. And especially we're told that when it comes to the book of Revelation, that we don't believe this doctrine because we don't, we don't believe the Bible says what it says and means what it means. We don't believe it literally. Well, look at Revelation chapter 20 with me and just read these first three verses of Revelation chapter 20. It says, I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. And after these things, he must be released for a short time. If you've got a King James Version, it talks about a bottomless pit. Let me ask you something. Is there such a thing as a bottomless pit? Could it even be a pit if it didn't have a bottom in it? Are there dragons? If there was a dragon and, and, and it was a spiritual being, do you think it could be held by a chain? Do you think you could chain him to the bottom of a bottomless pit and hold him there? Well, of course not. All of these things by their very nature must be figures. The idea that we don't believe the Bible to be true or that we're not accepting it as literally as it's intended to be accepted because we, we read the book of Revelation and understand there's a tremendous amount of figurative language, it is self-evident. 
It's self-evident. You read passages in the book of Revelation that defy the very laws of physics or, or the very concept of reality if you read them literally. Revelation chapter 12, this same dragon is going to swing his tail and a third of the stars are going to fall out of heaven. Let me ask you something. Could the earth even hold a being that was so large that it could swing its tail and knock stars down out of the sky? No. And by the way, brethren, every one of your premillennial friends or friends that believe in premillennialism understand that. They're going to read Revelation chapter 12 and the first three verses of chapter 20 as figurative language. So my question is, if that's a figure, why can't we accept what John says and realize that that's not the only two places in Revelation that are figurative? I've got another question. I, I guess I didn't have whoever this is in my contacts. I just got a phone number. It says, would the saints come down from heaven for the end of the seven-year battle, then remain on earth again for the thousand-year reign before going up to heaven again? Yes. Yes. And, and I see we're having problems with that because it, it sounds very strange, doesn't it? To go to heaven and then have God say, um, you got to go back. And not just for a minute either. You know, maybe Lazarus was, was resurrected and had been in heaven for a few moments and had to come back. I've always wondered how miserable that was for Lazarus to have to have to go through that. But what we're talking about here is coming back for a thousand years. And yes, that, that is exactly um, what this doctrine would teach. So the book of Revelation is used to support the rapture. The rapture is nowhere in the book of Revelation. And, and I think it's a great place to go and point out the hermeneutical flaw uh, that, that is inherent in premillennialism in which we're told that every word of the Bible has to be read literally and yet it doesn't take very long to find places where those who believe in premillennialism are going to have to acknowledge that there's figurative language that's being employed. Matthew 24. Matthew 24, and I, I won't take much time in Matthew 24 because we did a whole lesson on it. Uh, but the idea in Matthew 24 is that the first 28 verses of Matthew chapter 24 actually describe the tribulation. And so Jesus, according to premillennialism, is warning about this tribulation. But then when he gets down a little bit later in the chapter, he's going to tell them, don't worry about this tribulation too much, because if you're faithful, you're going to be caught up. That's, that's the way the premillennialists will define or, or explain verse 31 where it says he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet and they will gather the elect, his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. Here's the problem. That is a common phrase. And you might go back and read Isaiah chapter 11 in verse 12 and then Isaiah chapter 27 verses 12 through 13. That same language is used in Isaiah 11 verse 12 and 27 verses 12 through 13 to describe the gospel or the word of God being preached in order to bring about repentance. Brethren, this is not a rapture. What is being talked about, I believe, in verses 29 through 31 is the gospel sounding forth and having its desired effect upon those who have a good and honest heart, that is, bringing them to repentance. The idea of a secret catching away simply is not in Matthew chapter 24. If it is, where's the seven years? There's no mention of seven years. Where's the glorious return? There's no mention of a glorious return. As a matter of fact, the only return we get in, in following Matthew 24 is in chapter 25, and it's judgment day. And there's no denying that's judgment day at the end of Matthew chapter 25. And by the way, why is he telling the elect to run? If any part of Matthew chapter 24 describes the rapture, why is he telling the elect to run? Notice that with me. Matthew chapter 24, and there in verse 20, he's talking about what I believe to be the coming destruction of Jerusalem. But let's just say for just a second, he's talking about this seven-year tribulation. Remember, if you're righteous, if you're faithful, if you're the elect, you're going to get raptured up. You're going to get taken away. You're not going to go through this seven years. And yet, verse 20, Pray that your flight will not be in the winter or on a Sabbath. For then there will be a great tribulation, such as not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. 
Unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved, but for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Well, if I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, the elect aren't going to be here. They're not going to go through. They're not going to experience this, this difficulty, this tribulation. So why is Jesus telling them that if you believe me, run, and that the elect are going to be, uh, that, that the, the tribulation is going to be shortened for the elect. It doesn't make a lot of sense if the elect are going to be raptured or taken away. I got another question from Clinton. Do individuals who advocate a literal interpretation think Jesus lied to Nicodemus about being reborn or is this only to be applied to, to Revelation? You know, that's a good question. And, and I, you know, I wouldn't say anybody thinks Jesus lied, but they're definitely going to have to take a spiritualized interpretation of that. Uh, Nicodemus is the one who's asking the question, how do I go back and you know, come out of my mother's womb again? So obviously the, the literal interpretation isn't what Jesus uh, had in mind. So that, that's a great point. You know, another place to go is the book of Ezekiel. Because we're told the book of Ezekiel describes the battle of Armageddon. We're going to get into that a little bit in a couple of weeks. And yet in that, in that book, in that writing, um, we're told that there's a, a, a literal modern-day battle taking place. And yet there's not a single modern-day weapon mentioned in that entire book. So obviously there are going to be a lot of passages, a lot of passages uh, that you just cannot take literally. Um, in, in, the, in the Bible, New Testament, and Old. So if you will, take out your Bibles and open them to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And we're going to look at the end of 1 Thessalonians. <laughs> I, I got another good question here. Uh, Ethan is texting me. How do they interpret what is and isn't figurative? This is, this is the problem we have when we start adapting a hermeneutic to our doctrine rather than using the hermeneutic to find our doctrine. Everything becomes arbitrary. And, and I'm not saying that to put anybody down or to belittle anybody, but that's, that's just the simple truth. When we make arbitrary rules like every word of the Bible is literal, Brethren, there's never been a piece of literature written in which every word is literal. You know, even in a set of instructions that you might get with a sing swing set, there are going to be some things in there that are put in just to help your understanding. Maybe an example or something like that that's going to require some interpretation. Um, and, and so what we have to do is we have to let the author tell us how he's speaking. We have to look at the genre that we're reading, and I, I don't know that we give enough emphasis to that. You know, there's a difference in the way the book of Leviticus is written and the book of Revelation. And, and I don't think you have to be a real serious Bible scholar to read those two books and figure that out. But we've got a doctrine that tells us they have to be read the same. When any reasonable person can see they cannot be read, the same. So how do they figure this out? How do they decide what's fit, what's literal and what's not? Well, not to be rude, but if it being literal helps their case, then it's going to be literal. And if being figurative helps their case, it's going to be figurative. And by the way, we have to be careful we don't fall to that same trap and begin to act and to study our Bible in that same way. All right, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. Tim LaHaye says that 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is the passage that the pre-tribulation rapture is found here, and if it's not found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, it's not found anywhere in the Bible. And he's not the only one that says that. As a matter of fact, I found three or four scholars who take this position, and they said the same thing, that what we've got to do is we've got to go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we've got to understand the rapture there, and then kind of spread out through the Bible and find it in other places. Little problem the rapture is not in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And, and I can say that with the utmost of confidence. Remember the four things we've got to find uh, to have the rapture, right? We've got the secret and quiet coming of the Lord. We've got the catching up of the saints, both dead and alive. We've got the seven-year tribulation that follows. We've got the thousand-year kingdom that follows. 
Three of those four things simply are not in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And if this is the closest as they can get to a proof text, that seems to be a problem. So let's read the passage, beginning there in verse 13. We do not want to be, we, we, let me start over. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, the point of emphasis, I, I think, for most people who believe in the pre-tribulation rapture is the language of verse 17. And I think we need to be very careful. I've said in the past that the rapture is nowhere in the New Testament. It's not precisely true. A pre-tribulation rapture is nowhere in the New Testament. And I've heard people say, well, the word rapture is nowhere in the New Testament. Well, that's technically true. Uh, but in reality, if you look at the language there, that phrase caught up in verse 17 literally means to be seized violently or to be snatched up, which is the idea of rapture. The question is, is the premillennial concept of rapture, that pre-tribulation rapture, is it found here? Well, I'm going to have to say no based on the fact that no other component of the rapture is found here. And as a matter of fact, the description here of the return of Jesus is the very opposite of the way that the rapture is described in premillennialism. So let's notice a couple of things in the context. First of all, there seems to be a question, a concern among those in Thessalonica. What's going to happen to Christians who die before the Lord returns? It seems like they had an expectation that he was coming back soon. And they were concerned about those who had passed away. What's going to happen? And so I think Paul is writing in order to comfort them regarding this. And so he says there in verse 15, we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Notice what he says next. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. I don't know how to read that and come up with a secret and quiet coming of the Lord. Now, everything we just said about the Bible being literal and the book of Revelation being literal, this is a passage where the premillennialists cannot have a literal interpretation. And what they're going to tell us is that that's figurative language and that the only people who are going to recognize the coming of Jesus is going to be those who are taken. But brethren, that doesn't seem at all to be what this context is saying. Then we were alive, verse 17, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. What we're told is that meeting the Lord in the clouds is really the idea of meeting the Lord behind the clouds. That rather than all of faithful humanity being there in the sky for everyone to see, that what the passage actually describes is faithful humanity being hidden behind a cloud. Um, that's a stretch. That's a stretch. As a matter of fact, if you'll go back and trace that phrase in the clouds as it applies to the coming of the Lord or the coming of Jehovah throughout the Old Testament, it's the idea of, of the clear coming of Jehovah. Judgment or whatever is in the context becomes obvious when God comes in the clouds. This isn't about Jesus hiding. This is about Jesus being seen. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Where's the seven years? Where's the thousand years? Not even hinted at in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The passage where every scholar that teaches this, everyone who's written a popular book on it tells us this doctrine is taught and the primary components of the doctrine simply are not 
here. The main component, the secret taking away, clearly is not described. Then we have to believe as we move down to chapter 5 that there's a thousand and seven years between chapter 4 verse 18 and chapter 5 in verse 1, he says, Now as to the times and the epochs, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you, for you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness for that day, uh, for that for that the day would overtake you like a thief. It goes on and on. They tell us that chapter 5 describes the punishment of the wicked. And there seems to be some truth to that. But again, I haven't seen seven years. I haven't seen a thousand years. I haven't seen any reason to read anything different than we saw in John chapter 5. Where in that hour, the righteous and the wicked were raised together. The doctrine of the pre-tribulation rapture is not in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And brethren, if you'll do just a little bit of hunting, you'll find plenty of places were advocates of the pre-tribulation rapture will tell you that if it's not in 1 Thessalonians 4, it's not in the Bible. Now, brethren, I believe in a rapture. I believe the Lord's going to return one day and he's going to snatch us up off this earth. He's going to take us away. But there'll be no following seven years and there'll be no thousand years that we have to wait on. No, then comes the end. I got a final question. Uh, Bonnie asked, how do they get around verse 17 where it says, and so we shall always be with the Lord? I think it's in that idea again that, that we'll go to heaven with the Lord and come back with the Lord. Uh, Jesus is going to come back to establish that kingdom. So, And I think that's why someone says, well, why would we come back? It's so that we could remain with the Lord. Um, and, and so here we have this, this one passage that we're told is the passage. But brethren, nothing nothing that this doctrine depends on is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Um, it's sad to me, and, and I was talking to someone after services last week, it is sad to me how many people have been deluded by this doctrine. And, and the people who have been taught this and kind of, kind of been raised up in it, I hold no ill will toward them. I, I would not want to ridicule their faith. I would like to sit down and open a Bible with them and ask them, how do we make sense of these contradictions? How do we make sense of these problems? Uh, brethren, they've been deceived. They've been deluded. And I, I don't have to be arrogant to say that. A simple reading of the New Testament will show us that this doctrine of the pre-tribulation rapture is not from the mind of God. It is purely from the mind of man. And that's a sad thing because what we're talking about is our faith and who we put that faith in and what hope we have. And brethren, if my hope is not the hope of Scripture, I'm not sure how I can be saved. I'm not sure how heaven can be my home. Got another question that came in. We'll deal with this one and then we'll wrap things up. Chris asked in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10, when do they say the earth will be burned up? If it's after the thousand rain, uh, thousand year rain, then why is it going? And uh, then why, if if it's going to be such a perfect place, then that Christ is reigning? Man, that is a great question. I think you're right. Um, according to the premillennialists, the destruction of the earth is going to come after the thousand year rain. As far as why, I don't really know. Other than maybe they would say that it served its purpose, and that God has no use for it any longer. But I do have to wonder. Um, if, if heaven, if, if earth is going to be the Garden of Eden reborn uh, for that thousand years, which is essentially the idea, then, then why this transfer? Why heaven? Why, why do some of these things take place? And I don't have good answers for that. Um, but that's, that is an outstanding question. So I hope this has been beneficial to you. I've really appreciated the questions, uh, the text messages. I don't think I missed any. I didn't see any on YouTube. If I did miss your question, I apologize. Uh, but uh, I got several through the text message, and I, I really do appreciate you uh, chiming in tonight and participating. Um, I think the weather is supposed to be improving throughout the week. As far as I've seen on the weather, we should be able to be back here Wednesday. Uh, so please count on being here for Wednesday night for our, our Revelation study, and we'll look forward to seeing everyone. Before we do sign off, though, how about we bow our heads and have a word of prayer? 
Dear Father in heaven, we thank you so much, Lord, for all that you've done for us. Father, we thank you for the truth that we find in your gospel that gives us the great hope that we have of heaven. We thank you, Father, for revealing to us so much of your plan so that we might know what to hope for and we might have some way of anticipating the return of your Son. Father, we thank you for the resurrection, for the fact of it, and also for the doctrine so that we can understand just how clearly and how true it is that this world is not all and that there's something beyond it. We thank you for the promise of heaven, not some temporary promise to be restored again in some time, but our home in which we'll dwell with you forever. Father, these things are powerful and meaningful to us. They help us to navigate this difficult life, and we thank you for that. Lord, we pray that you'd be with those that are sick. There's so many right now that are suffering and are struggling with illnesses. Uh, we pray that you'd be with Teresa, that you'd be with her brother and her sister-in-law. Uh, we pray that you'd be with my mother-in-law, Pat, and my sister-in-law, Laura, as they're struggling with COVID. Uh, we thank you, Father, for those that have recovered and those who have put this behind them. And we pray, Lord, that uh, we might continue to find more and more avenues to deal with this this problem that's plagued us with for so long. But Father, help us to remember that our true issue and our true concern is not some virus, but that it's sin and sin's effect on our life. Help us, Father, to turn to your Son and to turn to your Word and to seek our hope and our salvation there. Father, we pray that you'd be with us until we can be a get together again. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, I appreciate your attention. Look forward to seeing you again Wednesday night, and we'll go ahead and sign off.